Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Star here with you guys. We are going to be getting into Chapter 12, Key Issues 1 and 2 today, and we are going to be talking all about services. And so our two questions are, where are services distributed? So we'll get into what services are, and then we'll be looking at specifically where are consumer services distributed. So if we start off, we need to take a quick look at the basics of services. And so services are activities that fulfill a consumer need um, in, in exchange for money or, or some kind of uh, bartering system. And so when we look at this, services are typically economies that are linked to settlement. The more service economies we see tend to be linked to these more settlement settled areas. And so proximity to customers is the only priority we can talk about when we talk about services themselves. And so service economies are also linked to, like we just said, development. MDCs tend to have more services. And so when we look at like a, a more developed country or a developed country, they will have more service related economies in general. And so we can kind of see a little bit of that on the right. We see our different types of services. Uh, when we look at the percent of all of our U.S. jobs here, you can see um, only 2% of our are in the agricultural mining field. We look at manufacturing and construction, about 13%, and everything else there is then service-oriented, all right? Public services, business services, and consumer services. So we classify services in three different versions here. We talk about consumer services, and it's about 50% of all U.S. jobs. So it could be anything from retail to education to healthcare to leisure activities. Um, and so a very, very large um, area here. <clears throat> we also look at business services. And this is about a quarter of all U.S. service jobs. And this is thinking more along the lines of things like financial, uh, could be banking, could be professional or information services, or even transportation, all right, taking goods from one place to another. And then finally, we look at public services, and that's about 8% of all U.S. jobs that we talk about when we look at service jobs here. And so we're talking about like federal, state, and local governments in this case, all right, whether it is uh, police officers, uh, firefighters, or if we look at more of a federal level, we can talk about uh, people in federal offices and things like that. All right. So we look at GDP around the world here, our gross domestic product, and you can see how much money each area brings in on, a, on the scale of services. And so if we look at uh, North America, obviously, Western Europe, Japan, uh, and New Zealand rank in at kind of our top. And we tend to look at those areas as our more developed regions of the world. And so that should make sense. If we look at the areas that are lower, when we look at services, we look at uh, Africa, the, uh, kind of Southwest Asia, <clears throat> and then East Asia and South Asia as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's our growth of services as well. We call this the tertiary sector. And so when we look at the tertiary sector, talking about services, you can see just how much uh, we, we're talking about here, how much growth there has been since 1975, all the way up to 2015 and beyond. A couple things that we don't have in the book are looking at different types of services. And we talk about this as quaternary and quinary. So they are kind of part of tertiary. When we talk about primary, we're talking about resource-based extractive activities. So mining, agriculture. Uh, we look at secondary as being manufactured-based. And tertiary then is your service-based. And underneath tertiary, there's these other two sectors too, quaternary and quinary. And so when we talk about quaternary, we are talking about knowledge-based activities. And so this is usually high-level services aimed at collecting and processing some kind of data in some way. And so when we talk about this, uh, it tends to be at the high end of the commodity chain. And examples like this would be like banking or financial institutions, um, sometimes even um, uh, different aspects of government. And so they may locate near universities or government or, or corporate headquarters. All right. We also have quinary services and quinary services are pretty similar, but now we're looking at intellectual based kind of macro activities. So on a larger scale, um, we tend to look at um, these these services and this, this industry kind of requiring high level knowledge that's specified in one specific area. It also tends to be at the top of the commodity chain. But now we're looking at things more like scientific research. All right. Or high level management of something. And again, they'll also locate near universities, governments and corporate headquarters. So you can kind of see some of the GDP co composition by sector and our labor force by occupation. Again, we're seeing kind of similar ideas here. It's tough to see with that key. The key's kind of crazy here. Um, we've got uh, agriculture and gr the green side there, services on the blue side and industry on the red side. Uh, and you can kind of see where those uh, different sectors are distributed across the globe. 
We also can look at some of these commodity change when we talked about industry sectors. Again, we've got primary and secondary up top. You've got your tertiary on the right there. And then underneath, like we said, underneath tertiary, you've got these other two industries, quaternary and quinary. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, getting into services and, and where, where they're distributed and why they might be distributed in a certain place, we talk about a big theory, and that's something that you should definitely have here, guys, is central place theory. All right, sometimes it's called the Christaller theory because it was invented by Walter Christaller in the 1930s. But this helps all businesses to identify the most profitable location for their business. And so what it basically says is it states that competition of central places will lead to a regular pattern of settlement over the landscape. And we can look at this on like a large scale and a smaller scale as well. Now, when we look at this, the components of this, you can see the pictures below. Um, you have the central place, which is the market center. And that's kind of what the little black dot is for each of those. That's where you exchange goods and services. And then you've got the hinterland, which is that kind of orangish area around it. It's also called the market area. And that area is the basically the surrounding area of where all the customers are at. And they might, they would most likely frequent the services if they're in the, in the goods, if they're centralized in that little black dot in the middle. <clears throat> And so when we talk about the market area range and threshold, these are kind of the, the three big ideas that uh, we look at when we talk about central place theory. Like we just said, the market area in this case would be that hexagonal shape. Anything inside there would be part of the market area. The range would be like the radius, how far away you're willing to travel for that service. And then the threshold is how many people do you need in order to keep that business or that service or good uh, making money. All right. And so that's where we get everything kind of brought in together here. And so if we look at, we can we kind of see the, the beginning of these mega regions, right? When we talk about throughout the United States here, um, again, most of what we see is Minnesota here and parts of Wisconsin, even parts of the Dakotas, we look at as being part of the Twin Cities mega region, right? Meaning people from all over those places will come to the Twin Cities for specific goods or services. All right. Now, the further away you get, depending on what the good or service is, the less likely you may be to travel long distances for it. But that is kind of what we look at when these when we talk about these mega regions. And if you go further east, you can see that these mega regions are much, much smaller. People are less willing to travel farther because you have more large cities as you go, right? And as you go further west, there's fewer large cities. So people are willing to travel farther to get to some of these things. And so when it comes down to our market area, uh, market areas vary by service. And so this is where I talked about central place theory being on multiple levels. We can talk about on the level of like a city and multiple cities, or we can talk about on the level as a business itself. All businesses in the, in the country, in the world, use some sort of this, the idea of, of central place theory here to figure out where to place their businesses. And they use two pieces of information. They use range and threshold. All right, like we just mentioned, range is the maximum distance that people are willing to travel to get to that service. This can vary based on what the cost is, what the availability of that service is. Um, and, and so it may be something that is easier to get to, or maybe people aren't willing to, uh, to travel as far for it. And then the, that would obviously determine its range. When we look at threshold, it's the number of people that need to support that service. Again, this, this varies based on the income of the people, the age of the people, and then what the target consumer of that product or that service may be. And so, again, all companies use this data to determine how profitable they're going to be. And so when we look at this, how, do, how can we compare the range and threshold of different, of different businesses? If we look at the left there, a fast food place like McDonald's, right? That's our McDonald's right here in Cottage Grove. How does that compare to, say, the Minnesota Twins, right? People are not willing to travel that far to get to a fast food restaurant, right? They're just not because there's, a, there's an abundant supply. They, they're not willing to travel that far. And so, yeah, you might be willing to travel um, in the city or maybe even to the next city over to get to that McDonald's if you don't have access to one closer to you. But people are willing to travel literally from different states to come watch the Twins, right? People from Wisconsin, people from outside, outstate Minnesota, people from the Dakotas will travel down to watch Minnesota Twins baseball, all right? Uh, if we look at the threshold, again, a, a fast food restaurant, because they pull from the people in that area, in that range, they don't need as many people to be viable, right? It doesn't cost millions of dollars for them to produce hamburgers, whereas we look at the twins, it costs literally millions of dollars for them to pay the salaries of their of their players. And so they are going to need a larger area, a larger threshold of people that are able to support that franchise or that team. 
All right. So when we look at this again, people are willing to travel further for services that are rare. And if you look at like in North and South Dakota, there is no baseball team. And so they are willing to travel further to get to the Twin Cities in order to watch a game. Whereas in North and South Dakota, there is going to be a McDonald's. And so people may not be willing to travel that far to get to a McDonald's. We can also rank settlement, and that's when we get to we get to this idea of rank, uh, this uh, the central place theory based on cities as well. And so when we rank settlements, there's two ways that we rank settlements. Rank size rule, which is where the settlement follows kind of a regular pattern, and that's kind of the best example is that picture on the right there of the of the people kind of stepping down. Uh, it actually follows this this. Uh, form here. It says the nth largest city is one nth the population of the largest city. And so that means that the second largest city then would be half the size of the largest city. The third largest city would be a third of the size of the largest city and so on and so forth. And so we can look at this. A lot of uh, more developed nations or countries will have this kind of rank size rule. So we can see it is tied to development, right? When we look at primate cities, this means that there is a city that has a, a population two times greater than that of the second largest city. And so a couple of really good examples of this would actually be uh, Paris in France, London in the United Kingdom, and Mexico City in Mexico. Those cities are much, much bigger than all the other cities in their country, more than two times greater. And so we look at that as um, in those places or in those nations or those states where they have the, that issue uh, or they have a primate city rule, they then tend to use periodic markets. They set up these marketplaces in these smaller cities and they'll travel around and uh, from city to city. And when they do that, they uh, provide goods and services for the people in that city. That way, everyone doesn't have to travel to, say, Paris to get all the goods that they need on a regular basis. These, these traveling markets will pop up to provide goods for the people in smaller cities, too. Okay, so two, two ways to look at settlement. Rank size rule, primate city. So here's a couple of examples here. You can see Mexico on the bottom there, and you can see that um, you have Guadalajara, and then we kind of work our way down after Mexico City. Uh, we work our way down. You can see that Mexico City has over 20, 000, 20 million people. Guadalajara has about 5 million. So that's definitely more than two times larger, right? And it continues to work its way down. When you look at the United States, uh, you can see we've got New York City on the far left there at just under 20 million. And then we've got Los Angeles, Houston, Boston, and it continues to work itself down. Um, and that's more of a rank size rule where it's stepping down one nth uh, time each time, right? Los Angeles is about half the size of New York. And uh, if we go down, Houston is about a fifth the size of New York and so on and so forth. So we can kind of look at this on a couple different uh, examples. If we look at Canada's largest cities, you got Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, and downward here. Uh, if we look at this and we go, uh, Toronto is the largest city. Montreal being about half the size of, of Toronto. Calgary being about half the size of Montreal. Not exactly. It's not going to be perfect, right? Because this is the real world. But we can see that Canada, for the most part, kind of follows a rank size rule, right? Not exactly, but kind of. Right. Uh, if we look at Minnesota, Minnesota's largest cities, uh, we have Minneapolis at 383,000. We have St. Paul at 285,000. We can work our way down. Does that follow rink size rule? Not particularly, right? Uh, does it follow primate city? It doesn't do that either. If we were to do this, if we were to take Minneapolis and St. Paul and combine them together, we would definitely see a primate city, right? You've got the twin cities then there at uh, over 500,000 people for sure. Okay, and then stepping down then to Rochester next. All right. So again, Canada, not perfect rank size rule, but it's definitely not a primate city either. So we look at the size of these settlements. How does that actually affect the services? And how does it rank back then or bring back to central place theory? We talk about the settlement ranking and the size of settlements linking to the size of the market area. And so the larger the city, the larger the market area of that city. Central place theory not just works on the scale of a business, it also works on the scale of a city itself. And so when we talk about this, there are very few large settlements and many small settlements kind of nestled in alongside those large settlements. We, we look at it from this point of view. You have cities, you have towns, villages, and hamlets. Now in Minnesota, we call them all cities, but they're, uh, in other places, they do use this, this kind of step-down version, cities, towns, villages, and hamlets. And, and you can see that cities, depending on what their size is, 
obviously are going to have more goods and services located inside those major cities. And so these hexagon shapes, as you can see in the picture on the right, all kind of nest together. It's like this nesting pattern. You've got kind of the big red one. If you look at the very middle here, you've got the big red hexagon, and that's the the market area for the large city in the very middle of the picture. And then you've got all these small little dots, different colors and different versions of those dots. And you've got the hamlets, you've got the towns, you've got the villages all nestled in inside the uh, market area of the large city. All right. And so that's kind of what we look at as a nesting pattern, kind of like our babushka dolls there, the nesting dolls. They all fit together inside one another. And so we can see this actually working out in the real world. Right, this is North Dakota, and there's good old Minot, North Dakota, right there. That's your major city. And so around that, you've got all these uh, villages, you've got some hamlets, and you've got some small towns all nestled together nearby. Now, people in this whole area, this is going to be the whole market area of Minot. All right, people uh, from rugby. If they need to get to a good and good or service that isn't in their town, they may travel to Minot to get to it. All right. Whereas we look at people in Granville, if they don't have a, a good or service that they can access, they may go to Surrey first. And if they can't get in Surrey, they may continue on to Minot as well. All right. We know that, again, larger cities attract more goods and services, largely because there's more people that are willing to drive to that area. We also talk about this idea of profitability of location, and this is alongside the idea of, of central place theory. Geographers use central place theory to decide the range and threshold in order to determine where they actually should build their store. All businesses use this idea of central place theory in some way or another. They define what the market's going to be. They estimate what the range is going to be for their product uh, or their good. They, uh, they estimate the threshold, how many people is it going to take to support their business, and they predict the market share in general. And so when we look at this, you can kind of, in this picture here, you can compare the target stores uh, that we see here in Dayton, Ohio to the family dollar stores. And you can see, obviously, Target stores are going to have, uh, they're going to locate in higher um, income areas uh, versus the dollar store. And they're also going to have a little bit larger threshold and a little bit larger range. You can see there's a lot more family dollar stores than there are Target stores here. All right? And you can see the Target, the family dollar stores are all located in uh, areas that are a little bit lower income than, say, the median household income of, other, of where the Target stores are. All right. We can also look at determining the optimal location within the market itself. And again, all businesses, all companies use this model here too. It's called the gravity model. And this tells us that the best location is the shortest distance to the largest amount of people that are going to be in that market area. And so there's two ways we can look at the gravity model, linear settlements and nonlinear settlements. Linear settlements look at the optimal location as being the median. All right, so kind of the average between all of them. Where we look at nonlinear settlements, the optimal location is going to be based on calculations of the average distance to all customers. So you can kind of see the difference down here on the bottom, right? Linear settlements, the median is going to be in the middle, right? So A, B, C, the middle is D, and E, F, and G then are, are on the outside. But again, it's going to be further distance for G to get to. Whereas if we look at uh, below the secondary uh, part of it, they would actually locate uh, a little bit further to the east if we're looking at it as a map uh, so that it's closer to 19 and 15 they can get closer to that pizza shop then right it's more of an uh, an average distance versus kind of the median between everything okay it's not a major difference but it is the difference maybe between a business making extra money or, or not making extra money or maybe being viable or not being viable in the future and so when we talk about distance and how it affects behaviors, as you get further and further from a service, um, it actually increases, uh, or I should say decreases, the interactions that a customer may have. The further you go from that service, the less likely you are to use it. And so when we talk about this, the best example of this is uh, something we also talked about in agriculture as well, and that is this idea of a food desert. Um, an area, a food desert is an area that has limited access to affordable, nutritious food. And if we take a look at our map there, anything that has the dark purple, those are areas that um, more than 10% of people in that area don't, who don't have a car don't really have access to a, a supermarket within a mile. And so that means that it's very difficult for them to get to. So when we look at, um, they measure this in a couple different ways. In an urban area, they measure it as a mile. Right. If you don't have access to basically fresh food, fresh fruit and vegetables um, within a mile of your house in a rural area, they measure this at 10 miles. OK, 
Okay. And so as of the year 2010, the USDA, USDA actually reported that about 23 and a half percent of Americans live in some sort of food desert. All right. So it's actually a pretty sad situation. All right. And when we take a look here at the Twin Cities, you can see that, yes, there are some areas that pop up as uh, federally designated food deserts as well. All right. And you look, there's actually uh, fairly close to home. If we start to get down to it, um, you could technically count like St. Paul Park and Newport as being food deserts because they don't have a grocery store in that city itself. Yes, they might have convenience stores, but that's different. That's not access typically to fresh fruit and vegetables. Right. You have to have an actual grocery store to get those products. Okay. We also talked a little bit earlier about periodic markets, and this is one way to kind of fix the issue of food deserts and, and other aspects, although it's not used as much here in the United States. But this is basically a collection of individual vendors who all come together on certain days. They may offer food uh, or excuse me, goods and services on different locations on different days. And so we see this a lot of times in developing countries. Services and products will be available in a specific area for a short amount of time for a day so that people can get to them and they can get the products they need without having to worry about traveling all the way to a large market area or a large city. In urban areas, we're starting to see this more, even in developed regions of the world. Uh, we see this as basically offering residents the ability to get to fresh fruit, fruit and vegetables, fresh food here. So think farmers markets, think food trucks, kind of setting up and allowing people to come in and get the, the goods that they need, even in urban areas. All right. So this here is an example of France. And you can see that there's 15 different small towns and they're about 20 mile radius here. And they have different periodic markets that are set up at different times. Again, because the major city, Paris, is uh, it's a primate city. And so they not everyone can access Paris on a regular basis. So they need to have these periodic markets set up around the countryside. Something that started to change a little bit when we look at services is the idea of sharing services. And there's a couple areas that we look at sharing services pretty, pretty common today. Uh, sharing services are obviously services that involve some kind of sharing. And a lot of times we look at transportation and lodging as the main ones. Uh, today we're seeing ride sharing services become much more popular, uh, right? Lyft and Uber are your big ones. Um, and basically they match people looking for a ride with people willing to drive them, right? They have to be uh, designated as a Lyft or, or Uber driver. Um, and the issue is it's starting to compete with taxi services and it uses a, a different version of payment. And it's become uh, an area where we look at possibly changing or altering our behaviors in the future, this idea of sharing services here. Okay. When we look at lodging services, um, Airbnb and VRBO have become very popular in recent years. And again, this matches people who are looking for lodging in a specific city or place. And again, they are competing with hotels. So they've come onto the scene and started competing with these other services that have already existed. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. So I hope that you got everything you needed here from Chapter 12, Key Issue 1 and 2. We will see you again soon for our next Key Issues 3 and 4. Good luck, and we'll see you soon.